Magic lanterns use drawings and still photographs. Hints of the potential of using photography to create an illusion of movement is said to have resulted from a $25,000 bet. California railroad magnate Leland Stanford hired San Francisco photographer and traveling showman Edward Mybridge to prove that a running horse had all four hoofs off the ground. Mybridge came up with a clever idea to settle the dispute. He lined up a row of cameras attached to threads stretched across a horse's path. His technical breakthrough was a camera with an electronic shutter that could snap pictures in five hundredths of a second. When Mybridge showed drawings based on the photographs in sequence, they created an illusion of movement. Viewers called it a magic lantern gone mad. Stanford won his bet. Soon, Mybridge was traveling the country, projecting his photographic studies in motion. To more than a few in the audience, the fact that many of the images depicted naked models, including the photographer himself, was an added draw. In 1888, the entrepreneurial photographer brought his traveling show to West Orange, New Jersey. Here, he encountered an American legend, the wizard of Menlo Park, Thomas Alva Edison. To invent, Edison liked to say, you need imagination and a pile of junk. In 1877, at age 30, he astonished the world with the phonograph. Two years later, he demonstrated an electrical lighting system that illuminated entire cities. Edison had a number of qualities that I think made him uh, very successful, both as an inventor and as an innovator and entrepreneur. One, he had boundless enthusiasm for what he was doing. Secondly, he uh, had an indomitable will. He never thought of himself as failing at any time. When Mybridge met Edison, the photographer had another bright idea. What about combining the sound phonograph with moving images? The inventor was intrigued. On October the 8th, 1888, Edison announced plans to create an instrument that would do for the eye what the phonograph does for the ear. He had no idea how he'd accomplish this feat, but with typical shrewdness, he was staking a claim for a future patent. W.K.L. Dixon, a dapper Scott Irishman who sometimes served as the lab's photographer, was assigned to get the job done. Dixon was rather an aesthete. He um, dressed very elegantly. He, he liked to go to the theater. He, he was an elegant man. And he was actually only 28 when he started to work with uh, Edison on this uh, motion picture project. Dixon's first attempt to make photographs that moved used a series of tiny pictures wrapped around a cylinder device similar to Edison's first phonograph. They were viewed through an eyepiece, like a microscope. An early experiment, only seconds long, was called monkey shines. The crude images moved, but there was a long way to go, and Edison wasn't alone. There were people working independent of one another in, in, in numerous countries, in France, in England, here in the United States, and possibly elsewhere, all making moves toward this idea of, of capturing motion on film. In France, an experimental scientist, Étienne Jules Marais, inspired by Mybridge, designed a camera that took pictures of birds on a strip of perforated photographic paper. Step by step, the interconnections of movie history led to Paris. Visitors to the Exposition Universelle of 1889 debated whether the new Eiffel Tower was a thing of beauty or an eyesore. While showing his electrical light system at the exhibition, Edison learned more about Etienne Jules Marais' camera. When Edison returned to the United States, he had new instructions for Dixon. 
Use strips of photographic film perforated with sprocket holes to guide the pictures through an improved camera called the kinetograph. The new system was made possible by thin and flexible photosensitive celluloid, perfected by George Eastman, inventor of the Kodak camera. It wasn't long before Edison and Dixon were ready for a sneak preview. In 1891, the inventor's wife, Mina, hosted members of the Women's Clubs of America at the family home, Glenmont. The unsuspecting ladies were asked to peer into a wooden box through a peephole. Inside, they saw something amazing, a moving photograph. W.K.L. Dixon doffing his hat. The excitement of that moment must have been something to experience. To have gone to visit Mrs. Edison, and all of a sudden, here you are, the first people to see Thomas Edison's newest invention, this marvelous thing, right, motion pictures. Centuries of ideas and inventions were rushing together. A new way of reimagining the world was taking shape. A remarkable generation of inventors and visionary engineers was leading the way. In 1893, as W.K.L. Dixon increased his movie output, he constructed a large shack covered with tar paper. It was the first full-fledged movie studio. It was called the Black Mariah, because it reminded playful Edison experimenters of a police paddy wagon. Working in the Black Mariah, lab employees became America's first movie actors, photographing themselves in short scenes using a heavy, electrically-powered camera. One of the first films they made was blacksmithing scene. They would take a piece of iron out of the forge, and they'd pound it, and also pass around a bottle of, of beer among the participants. In 1894, Edison and Dixon were finally ready to take their new motion picture machine to the marketplace. A little more than $24,000 had been spent creating the new invention. Now it was time to cash in. On April the 14th, the first kinetoscope parlor opened on Broadway in New York City. In less than five years, the movies had been born. W.K.L. Dixon called the amazing new invention the crown and flower of 19th century magic. At the new kinetoscope parlors, a nickel bought 20 seconds of movie entertainment, often accompanied by separate music from a phonograph heard through ear tubes. At the Edison Laboratory, Dixon and his production crew rushed to keep up with audience demand. They produced over 75 peep show snippets in 1894 alone. Famous and not so famous performers visited the Black Mariah and were captured on film, including young sharpshooter Annie Oakley. Movies were hardly upscale entertainment. The early motion picture audience were people in bars, they were people traveling on trains, just stopping for a moment to, to view a motion picture to keep themselves amused while they were waiting for the next train. They were put into amusement parlors. This was kind of lower class uh, amusement. To maximize profits, each round of a boxing match was shown on separate kinetoscopes. It cost 60 cents for fight fans to see the whole bout. Despite a surge of early success, it didn't take long for the peep show fad to fade. Audiences wanted more. In France, two brothers, Auguste and Louis Lumière, were impressed by the kinetoscope, but they had a better idea. Why couldn't movies be like a moving magic lantern show, projected on a big screen and shown to a large audience, not one person at a time? By 1895, they had their motion picture system, a hand-cranked camera and projector called the cinematograph. 
The Lumiere brothers' first movie showed workers leaving the family photographic plant. Unlike Edison's bulky electrically driven system, their camera could move freely and capture scenes of everyday life, preserving forever a Lumiere family meal. The Lumieres had their first commercial screening in a Paris cafe in December 1895. They showed nine short films. The audience was entranced. And it's really from that moment on that you can say that motion pictures have been shown almost continuously, you know, every day, if not every hour of the day from that point onward. A popular early show was a comic scene featuring a boy, a man, and a garden hose. Within a few months, there were Lumiere movie theaters in London, Brussels, and Brooklyn, showing images from around the world. Back in the United States, feeling the competition, Thomas Edison and business partners acquired the rights to another inventor's machine. They made a few improvements and put Edison's name on it. Looking like a marriage of a magic lantern and the innards of a kinetoscope, the new machine was called the Vitascope. It made its debut on April the 23rd, 1896, at the Coster and Biles Music Hall in New York City. Well, I think when audiences first saw the movies being projected on a screen in a theater, it, it must have been an incredible experience. We can sort of laugh at it today because it seems so cliche, but the idea of seeing a train approaching you and you think suddenly it's rather like 3D, you suddenly think the train's going to crush you as it comes over you. It must have been quite impressive. And, and, and in a way, I don't think we can really understand just how magical and how exciting it, it was back then. In 1896, in the United States, there was only one place to see projected movies. A year later, there were hundreds across the country. Projected movies were all the rage in America, but innovations from France were still leading the way, and entertainers were replacing engineers. In the United States, if Edison was the wizard of movie machinery, in Paris, an imaginative Frenchman was the magician of movie storytelling. George Méliès was a performing magician, and he was also a wonderful artist as well. I love seeing Méliès's films because the direct relationship to magic is so clear, that they're often people producing and performing stage magic effects, but in a different way, things that just weren't possible at the time on stage. So he expands the ideas of stage performers in a very pleasant way, and it's great fun to watch. It's great fun to watch his inventiveness. Beginning in 1896, Méliès' visual trickery was not only a means to astonish audiences, he was exploring movie techniques that are still used today turning brief skits into short stories. In 1902, he produced a motion picture landmark based on a book by Jules Verne, A Trip to the Moon. I think Melies was a truly original character. He was getting some ideas from the productions of the day, from the magic theaters that he himself was heir to. But I think a lot of it was just clear insight, creative genius. American movie makers were scrambling to keep up with international competition. Always looking for something that would sell tickets, they weren't afraid to push the boundaries of propriety. May Irwin and John C. Rice were starring in this musical comedy, The Widow Jones, and at the very end of the musical comedy, they kiss. And uh, someone had the idea of, why don't we put it on the screen? In 1896, the kiss aroused calls for censorship. Absolutely disgusting, one critic called it. 
Whether watched through a kinetoscope peephole or in a darkened theater, movies were inherently voyeuristic. And there were filmmakers only too happy to tantalize public tastes. Not only men, but also inquisitive women, could ogle vaudeville strongman Eugene Sandow flexing his muscles. <laughs> 